Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifices of soldiers and sailors, Father, who gave their life on behalf of this country to give us these freedoms. Thank you, Lord, so much for uh, your goodness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for our freedoms in Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, that we might continue to grow in your grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Judges. The book of Judges. And we're going to uh, begin here with a, a reminder of the core, I think, uh, passage in the book of Judges. Uh, in Judges chapter 2, verse 11. And we're going to just look at the uh, cycle of uh, reversionism, we could say, in the book of Judges. Uh, we begin with Israel doing evil by reverting to pagan worship. And certainly we see that in Judges 2.11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. And the Lord, uh, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Those are male and female deities. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers. Now, after sin, the Lord oppressed Israel. The Lord sent various... Uh, countries against the children of Israel, and this would appear, be a period of servitude to these oppressors. And then finally, the children of Israel cry, they cry out to the Lord for deliverance and help, and the Lord sends judges, he raises up judges to deliver the children of Israel from their oppressors. So verse 14, uh, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers. Who despoiled them? He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Whenever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord has said, and as the Lord has sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, there's verse 16. The Lord raised up judges. This is a key verse in the book of Judges. The Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges. So they went back to the same old cycle of rebellion. So they were in servitude. God raised up. They cry out to the Lord for help. The Lord provides a judge. This is physical salvation. And the Lord provides rescue through the judge. The judges lead various armies in uh, battle and deliver the children of Israel from their oppressors. And the Lord grants a period of peace for a while. And then, guess what? Back in the same old cycle. After a time of prosperity, then the Israel, children of Israel went back to the same pagan deities, went back to the same rebellion against God, who delivered them from their oppressors. So we see this cycle certainly repeated. Now, what is the key to the repetition of this cycle? And I think there's an important phrase. When we see in the book of Judges, there are six cycles of rebellion. And uh, as you know, last week we looked at the downward spiral. Each cycle was getting involved into worse rebellion. So it's like a downward spiral. And the key phrase that shows these six cycles will begin in chapter 3, um, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. And let me show you here also on the screen um, this passage. Uh, I have it marked here in my Bible, Judges 3, verse 7. And this phrase right here, so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's the phrase we see repeated six times throughout the book of Judges. The children, so the children of Israel did evil and the side of the Lord shows you that this is the beginning of another cycle. Another cycle. Um, so we see that phrase in uh, chapter 3, verse 7. 
we see that phrase again further down in chapter 3. So we look at verse 12, uh, the reign of Ehud, the children of Israel did again, notice again here, they repeated the same cycle, did again evil in the sight of the Lord. There's cycle number two, cycle number two. Um, and then we go further down in the cycle, and forgive me if I'm scrolling too fast, but I'm going to go through this. Chapter 4, verse 1. When Ehud was dead, here's that phrase again. Children of Israel did again, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is repeated all the way through the book of Judges. We can see that phrase again in chapter 4. Uh, we can see that phrase repeated in chapter 6. Um, and then in chapter 10, verse 6 and following. And then finally in chapter 13, verse 1, cycle number 6. Let's look at Judges 13, verse 1. Here's that phrase again. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So when you see that phrase repeated, that's another cycle. That's a key indicator that this is another cycle. So when you count them up in the book of Judges, there's six cycles of rebellion uh, in the book of Judges. Now let's go back here in, uh, to our PowerPoint slide. And by the way, there's multiple judges under these cycles, like cycle, for instance, uh, cycle number four, we had the Midianite oppressors and we had the Gideon, Tola, and Jer. These are minor judges but they're in that cycle as well. And then cycle five, Jephthah, we have minor judges, Isban, Elong, and Abdon. And then finally, Samson would be the last judge. Um, so the reign of Samson really technically ends the chronology of the book. What we have at the end, the last couple chapters of the book of Judges actually occurs near the beginning of the record of the judges, chronologically, chronologically. So when we see the uh, Benjamite meltdown, if we want to put it that way, uh, and the concubine that was, you know, raped and killed and divided in 12 pieces and sent throughout the children of Israel, that episode of depravity, that technically begin, is actually near the beginning chronologically of the book of Judges. So Samson's judgeship in a chronology, we'll look at the chronology, not, not this week, but we'll look at the chronology and dating of the book of Judges probably next week. But we want to examine just briefly in, in the various judges. And there are seven minor judges and five major judges. Seven minor judges, five major judges. Now, what is the difference between a minor judge and a major judge? Well, it's like the minor major prophets. Minor doesn't mean less important, <laughs> okay? Uh, we have the major prophets, meaning that there's more writing uh, concerning them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then we have the 12 minor prophets, where letters are shorter, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, so forth. Uh, so in like manner, during the days of the judges, we have... Revelation devoted extensively to five judges, and then just a few verses uh, dedicated to these minor judges. For instance, let's begin in Judges chapter 3, verse 7. Judges 3, 7. We have uh, uh, Othniel and mentioned there. We only have here four verses mentioned concerning him. So the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, served the Baals and Asherahs. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them into the hand of Cushon uh, Rishthim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushon Rishthim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them from Othaniel, the son of Kenaz. Notice here, Caleb's younger brother. It's an interesting connection here. Caleb's younger brother continuing the faith in the family, right? Um, here the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He judged Israel. Notice what we, we examine the Spirit of the Lord coming upon various judges for endowment for leadership. 
understand that was a purpose for that particular ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not no reference to their salvation. Uh, it's not talking about church age and dwelling the Holy Spirit. Simply the Spirit is empowering them for a brief period of time for whatever action. It's, I would call this endowment, the endowment of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, verse 10. He judged Israel. He went out to war. The Lord delivered Cushon Remnon, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. His hand prevailed over the uh, Cushon Remnon, uh, Rithabim, and the land had rest for 40 years. Then Nathaniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So, very brief account here. I would classify him as a minor judge. Then we have an extensive revelation, further verses. Notice Ehud. At least if you can read this, I know it's small print, but you have deliverer number two. By the way, the location of their enemies, this map shows, the Mesopotamian enemy is number one. And then Ehud, we have down further south, the Moabite enemies. See that right down here. Remember, Ammon and Moab were traditional enemies of the children of Israel in various periods of history. So we have the judgeship of Ehud. We won't get into all the details, but we have a little more revelation. We have from verse 12 through 30, so I'd call that a major judge. Ehud would be a major judge. What do we know about Ehud? He was left-handed. And uh, it's interesting that the children, uh, the Ehud was left-handed, I think in verse 15 of Judges 3. Let's look at that verse. So when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Now, we know that Saul, by the way, came from the tribe of Benjamin, a Benjamite. Uh, by him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon. So I think about Ehud and Eglon in this account. He was left-handed. And uh, I was talking to someone this morning about, uh, I think Pam mentioned, uh, don't forget the lefties. So, okay, Pam, I'm not forgetting the lefties. I'm a lefty. How many left-handed people do we have here? Look at that. Look at the lefties here. I noticed none of you raised your right hand. <laughs> Maybe one. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's the lefties. So, the Lord used a left-handed individual to deliver the children of Israel. All right, we have next uh, Shagmar. Uh, Shagmar would be a minor judge. One verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 31. Let's look at that. After him uh, was Shagmar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad. He delivered Israel. Now, an ox goad would be almost like a spear, not quite, but it would be like a prod, very long prod that would, you know, move along the ox, <laughs> you know, kind of a um, prod him along, so forth. And the Lord used that simple implement, uh, instrument, to deliver the children of Israel. So he defeated 600 men with an ox goad. And that's all is said here. Uh, Shagmar, the son of Anoth, he delivered 600 men of the Philistines. Notice the enemies over here. So we have the Philistine incursion. Who was the other uh, judge that fought the Philistines? Samson. Samson. So we have really two judges that fought, um, you know, Philistine oppressors. One verse for, uh, for Shagmar, but you know what? We have several chapters for Samson. We have 13, 14, 15, 16, four whole chapters devoted to the life of Samson. Same, same enemy, but we have the emphasis here, Samson. And he fought the Philistines as well. So Shagmar's mention would be a minor judge. Then we have the account of Deborah. We're going to look at Deborah this morning, but before we look at Deborah, we're going to just briefly mention some of these other judges. Um, Deborah is the only female judge. She is the only female judge that is mentioned. And again, I think there was a vacuum of godly male leadership at that time. Even Barak uh, was hesitant to, to go without Deborah. 
and we're going to address that. Uh, some evangelical feminists, I know that sounds like a contradiction, <laughs> some evangelical feminists, you try to use Deborah to justify women in the pulpit, uh, and therefore they, they point to her as an example of a, a female leader in the Old Testament. But keep in mind, you're in a period of time when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I would not exalt the period of judges <laughs> as an example, one example, one woman to judge as a standard for set for church leadership. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's faulty um, theology. So we have here, Deborah was the only female judge. We have the oppressors would be uh, Jabin of the Canaanites. Now, Canaanites can refer to the inhabitants of the whole land of Israel or a particular location in Israel. More than likely, this would be this area along the seacoast. The Canaanites here would be the opponents uh, dealing with the battle here because we know the battle that took place here, Megiddo is probably in this location uh, under Deborah, and uh, we have that Jezreel Valley was the area of the battle. So uh, the Canaanite incursion was for those uh, groups living along the seacoast there. So it's interesting that each judge, when we look at this map, has, is localized. They're local. So when we started out our series in the book of Judges, we indicated that judges are not leading the whole nation. Understand that. They're not leading like the kings. Uh, they're over certain areas, and uh, therefore uh, there's particular areas you can have even an overlapping chronolog chronologically of the judges, too. Um, but uh, n needless to say here, Deborah is uh, over dealing with the Canaanite incursion over in the Valley of Jezreel in this area. Now we have Gideon. Uh, most of us have heard, um, you know, the account of Gideon. Uh, Gideon was uh, an, from an obscure family. Uh, his family background was insignificant. Um, you know, the Lord called him a mighty man of valor, and Gideon basically saying, who, me? <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Like Moses, by the way. Moses said, I'm, I st stutter. How are you going to use me to deliver the children of Israel against Pharaoh? Think about how God uses people from insignificant backgrounds with limited abilities so that the power of God can be manifested. And I think that shows that God can use every one of us. Each one of us, God can use in his plan. So we have here uh, Gideon. Gideon, a man of faith. And uh, maybe down the road, we'll look briefly at Gideon and uh, his faith and how the Lord used him. Uh, then we have, notice we have uh, six, seven, and eight, three chapters devoted to Gideon. Three chapters in the book of Judges devoted to Gideon. So he would be a major judge in the book of Judges. Then we have a minor judge mentioned in chapter 10. Let's take a look at chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 10, verse 1 and 2 of Judges. Tola, Tola. And uh, we see that account here in verse 1 and 2. After Abimelech there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. How about that? <laughs> You're about the Dodo bird. <laughs> There's some interesting names in the family. <laughs> Dodo, a man of Issachar. He dwelt in uh, Shamar in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years, and he died and was buried in Shamir. Now, think about that. that's all that was said about uh, this particular judge. So um, not a lot is said uh, uh, about Tola, but he did, God did use him to deliver the children of Israel. Uh, then we have another minor judge in uh, verse 3, uh, Jer, uh, it mentioned here. After him arose Jer, a Gileadite. He judged Israel 22 years. And what's important about him, it's interesting, he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. <laughs> and also had 30 towns. 
who are called Habath Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Cayman. And that's all it is said about life of Jair. 30 sons, 30 cities, 30 donkeys. <laughs> all right. Then Jephthah is mentioned in chapter 11. He would be a minor judge, or excuse me, a major judge. We have a chapter and a few verses devoted to Jephthah. Remember, he made a foolish vow. Jephthah made a foolish vow. If you give me victory over uh, this enemy, the first thing that will come out of my house, I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. That was a stupid vow, stupid promises. People like to make stupid promises and times of emotionalism. And we got to weigh our promises and our commitments. Um, what happens if it's your daughter who comes out? And we had the debate about whether he actually sacrificed his daughter or was his daughter a perpetual virgin. We had that option, uh, either one. And, but needless to say, what he offered to God was foolish, foolish. And again, we have to be careful. There's a lot of religious people that are into making commitments, making vows, making this or that. I think the important ones are mentioned in the Word of God. We need to dedicate our bodies as a living sacrifice. And as the Lord commands us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, if you want an important vow or commitment, that would be a commitment of your body to do the Lord's will. That's the act of dedication that occurs after salvation. Of course, to have eternal life, you don't need to dedicate your life to the Lord. Well, obviously, we hear sometimes testimonies you know, I gave my heart to Christ or I dedicated my life. Well, that's great if you're already a believer, but that's certainly not required. That's not how you're saved. You're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again. And uh, therefore, it's not your Christian dedication that saves you. Obviously, after you're born again, the Lord wants your dedication. And so Romans 12, 1 and 2, I think is key. But just to make foolish promises to God, foolish commitments um, without thought, you know. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we can make commitments to God, but certainly we want to consider the cost. Even Jesus talked about discipleship. If you want to follow me, consider the cost. Forsake father, mother, sister, and brother, and come follow me. Christian discipleship is to be thought about. It's a serious consideration. What will it cost me if I stand for the cause of Christ? Um, so he made a fool. We, what we know about him is that foolish vow. But God did use him to deliver the children of Israel against the Ammonites. So you see in this map here, we have the uh, Ammonite um, further down, number five here. Uh, Midianites and Ammonites, or excuse me, uh, number six right here, Ammon. Ammon would be on the other side of the Jordan River. These will be inhabitants on See, the Jordan River runs from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. So the Ammonites would, cut, would be the enemies over here. And that was under Jephthah. Uh, then we have a minor judge in chapter 12, Ib Ib Ibzan, in chapter 12, verse 8. Let's look at Ibzan. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. Uh, we know that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, eventually came from the town of Bethlehem. He had 30 sons, and he gave away 30 daughters in marriage. Remember, we had, at least that's better than 30 donkeys, right? <laughs> he had 30 sons and gave away 30 daughters in marriage. Wow. <laughs> Imagine how many weddings you would have to attend. <laughs> that's all he was doing, right? <laughs> He brought in 30 daughters from uh, elsewhere for his sons. He judged Israel seven years, and Ibzan died and was buried in Bethlehem. And that's all we know about Ibzan. 30 sons and 30 daughters. Uh, then we have the next minor judge, Elon, in verse 11, following here, chapter 12. After him, Elon, the Zebulonite, Judge Israel, he judged Israel 10 years, and Elon the Zebulonite died and was buried in Ajalon in the country of Zebulun. And now that's all that we have about Ibsan. Um, 
Not much else is mentioned here. And then another minor judge, judge number 11, would be Abdon, mentioned in verse 13 through 15. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pyrethonite, judge Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. Kind of a bit beat out, uh, you know, Ibzan. <laughs> But here is his sons are mentioned here instead of the daughters. He had 40 sons. Uh, think about a house full of boys or a house full of girls. <laughs> uh, I don't know which one would be more difficult. I would think it's, it's debatable, right? It's debatable, right? Sometimes you think. All right. 40 sons, 40 grandsons who rode on 70 young donkeys now <laughs> instead of 30. Uh, he judged Israel eight years. Uh, then Abnon, the son of Hillel, the uh, Parathonite, died and was buried in Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the mountains of the Amalekites. He would be a minor judge. And then finally we come to probably the most well-known judge, Samson. We know that Samson was a Nazarite. Uh, and don't confuse the Nazarite vow with Jesus being from Nazareth. See, a Nazarene. Jesus was a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. That's very important because, you know, well, you know, they, they said, didn't Jesus have long hair? And he tried to argue that from being a Nazarite, but the two don't mix. The two are not the same. Uh, and therefore, uh, there was a certain commitment there that Samson had to God related to his hair. Um, and uh, God used him uh, to deliver the children of Israel. But if we study his life, we know there are a lot of major character flaws, wouldn't you say? Um, uh, I don't know if I would call, I, I guess you would call him, when you say a womanizer, I guess that would be characteristic of Samson, wouldn't it? Uh, he loved his women, and that caused him problems. Uh, eventually, Delilah, obviously, uh, caused his downfall. And the strongest man in the world was weakest through his relationship with a foreign woman. Not only, not simply, a, his parents wanted, you know, why don't you marry a good Jewish girl? <laughs> Basically. Uh, no, he loved the foreign women. Um, and uh, that ultimately, Jezebel was his downfall. His downfall. And uh, he was a believer. Samson was a believer. I, we'll see him in heaven, but he died to sin and a physical death. His eyes were plucked out at the end. Think about that. The lust of the flesh and God, God and justice, I think, plucked out his eyes at the end, um, and he died. Uh, tragic end, but God did raise up, and he is, he is a man of faith. Uh, we know that. I think the New Testament in Hebrews 11 mentions Samson. He's one of those judges that are, that are mentioned, and he was a man of faith, although he had character flaws. He had weaknesses. Okay, that is chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. So four major chapters are devoted to the last judge mentioned in the book of Judges. Now, this chart goes on to mention Eli and Samuel and a couple minor judges mentioned in the book of 1 Samuel, but as far as our purposes are concerned, in the book of Judges, there are 12, 12 judges, seven minor and five major Okay, let's take a look then at um, the book of Judges. We want to look at uh, the account of Deborah. Deborah. So let's focus on Deborah in Judges chapter 4. And let's take a look at uh, verse, begin in verse 1. Judges chapter 4. Verse 1, when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabon, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harashit Hagoyim. I think it's related to that, that Hebrew word, goyim, uh, meaning a Gentile. So uh, that's Tidi Hagoyim. 
Now, these two locations I have on the map, uh, by the way, Deborah, uh, we will see in verse 5 where she judged from between Bethel and Ramah, but uh, let's take a look at um, the location, I think, here. This map uh, shows these, uh, the oppressors and where the commander is located. Hazar is north of the Sea of Galilee. Let's see if I can zoom in on this map here. Um, and show you the location of Hazar. Uh, Hazor. Um, Hazar here is this town north of the Sea of Galilee, and this is the origination of uh, Jabon. So verse 2 says, The Lord sold them into the hand of Jabon, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. This is a Hazor north of the Sea of Galilee. Now his commander, um, is dwell was Sisera, he dwelt in uh, the Harashit Hagoyim, and that location is further south. So we look down right here. This is at the edge of the Jezreel Valley in the land of Israel. So he dwelt there, and that is the center location of the battle. This battle will occur in that Jezreel Valley. A lot of historic battles occur. And the future battle for campaign of Armageddon will be a staging area for the Antichrist and his armies. So it's interesting. Historically, that was the area of conflict. And here, this is the commander of um, Jabin. His commander was located there. Now, uh, Sisera then was the one who commanded the oppressor's armies. Uh, then verse 3 Children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. Certainly this was a time of the Iron Age, and uh, the children of Israel's oppressors had a monopoly on the iron market, if you want to put it that way. So they were at an advantage over the children of Israel militarily. They had a great advantage militarily over the children of Israel. Um, and uh, But, you know, the battle was the Lord's. Right, about even though outnumbered and having greater equipment militarily, uh, ultimately God is the one who delivers in battle. So I don't care; you can have the greatest military under uh, you know God's green earth, so to speak. But if you have a country bent on perpetual evil, then how can you expect victory? Now, don't get me wrong; a strong military is very important. Absolutely, I believe in a strong military. Um, that is that is so vital, but it goes hand in hand with a godly remnant, a godly country um, for success. Certainly, that's the way through the uh, that these various battles are mentioned. Whether you're in the book of Joshua, Judges, or under King David, Saul, and later. Now, here uh, let's take a look. Here in verse three, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, as we saw in the cycles. <laughs> they're oppressed. Now they're calling out to the Lord for help. Um, and Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. So he was in particular a harsh oppressor. He wasn't gracious. And Deborah, the Lord raised up a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. Now, location of her judgeship, we will look at the map here and every time I put this escape I always have this thing that comes up here so that's it all right let's take a look at the location of her judgeship which I think is this map right here two towns Bethel and Ramah uh, and she judged in the hill country of Ephraim now we know that there's a central area of Israel if you look at five actually major uh, geographical um, aspects to the land, so to speak. Uh, in the middle, we have the hill country, where Jerusalem, by the way, uh, is also in the, that hilly area of uh, the land of Israel. So the hill country of the tribe of Ephraim, there in that region uh, between Bethel and Ramah, Deborah judge. So we see here, in verse 5, she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, 
in the mountains of Ephraim, the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abimenoam, from uh, Kadesh in Naphtali. That's a tribe of Israel. He said to him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Now that's further north from where Deborah had judged. Take with you 10,000 men, the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. Um, so we look at the uh, area further north. Oh, by the way, the judgeship of Deborah is an interesting location, Ram and Bethel. All in this area, we have a lot of, judge, lot of prophets uh, and judges centered. We have Samuel, by the way, who came from Rama. Samuel came from Rama. Uh, he had an annual circuit in that area, Rama and Bethel. Amos the prophet uh, prophesied uh, from the area of Bethel. Later on, the prophet Amos. Jeremiah, just south of that, north of Jerusalem, Anatoth. Uh, then many of, the, many of the writing prophets came from Jerusalem. So you had kind of a hotbed of prophetic activity uh, where Deborah came from, including Samuel later uh, in that area. Okay, let's take a look then at the deployment of forces. Uh, so we have here the uh, gathering of forces to go into conflict. Mount Tabor would be the hot spot of the battle. Now, I think uh, later on in this map here, uh, one view here is it's a little better view. This hilly area, Jezreel Valley, extending this area uh, down through this area, Kishon River, which is mentioned in the text, running through that Jezreel Valley. Megiddo being the location of the armies opposing Israel, and they came through that flat Jezreel Valley. And Israel had at least the advantage of the high ground, Mount Tabor and the hills surrounding that area. So they had the high ground advantage militarily. Uh, so Mount Tabor would be the area, and right probably in that area would be the area of conflict at the foot of Mount Tabor. So uh, the gathering of the men from these various tribes, we see two tribes in the north. We have Nap Naphtali this tribal area, and Zebulon, this area. So these were two tribes that would contribute to the army of Israel that were from the north. So the uh, tribe of Zebulon and Naphtali are mentioned here as contributors to the army that would be engaged in conflict. And that's what we have here in verse 6. So we have Kedish and Naphtali, uh, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor, take with you 10,000 men of the son of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. Two tribes there north of the conflict. Verse 7, And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and the multitude at River Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. Now this is God speaking, by the way. Verse 7 is God speaking here. Sometimes when we read it, uh, we miss that out, but I will deploy Sisera, God permitting Sisera uh, in, to be engaged in battle so he will eventually deliver the children of Israel and show his power. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. So he had to have the comfort and assistance of a woman by his side before he would be, in, he would engage in battle. Now, question arises: Was Deborah actually leading the armies of Israel in battle? And the answer is no. I believe clearly she was not leading. She went with Barak, and I probably stood uh, at the uh, the uh, area of battle, and it was kind of like, okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead, you know. <laughs> Fight those enemies, you know. Mm -hmm. So he had a woman backing his, uh, you know, conflict, Barak, um, <laughs> to go up to battle. So here, um, Deborah went with Barak uh, to the area of conflict, but I don't think she actually led the army in battle. That is Barak's uh, job here. Uh, 
So I think it might address the issue of women in combat. Uh, we might have the issue there that arises. I don't think women should not be in combat. They can be in the military, but I think combat is, is a whole different story. And you need unit cohesion when you go about go out to battle and conflict. And uh, there's a lot of physical limitations. I'm not saying a woman cannot be strong, but there are things related to being a woman that might hinder, you know, success in any military battle or victory. Um, but Barrick, I, I think here, uh, said, no, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. Okay. Verse 9. So she said, you know, okay, I'll go with you, but you know what? Who's going to get the credit for the battle? A woman. But it's interesting when she said that, it wasn't Deborah uh, that ultimately killed Sisera. It was another woman, Jael. Jael was the one that ended killing Sisera later on. Jael with the nail, right? The tent peg. <laughs> later on at the end of the chapter. Nevertheless, I will surely go with you, uh, and uh, but there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And that was jail later in the chapter. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, this is the area Kadesh Naphtali, which is this region, Mount Tabor. Let's zoom in on this map here. Um, this would be this location, Kadesh, Naphtali. Uh, remember, Kadesh Barnea is south of Israel. So when you're looking at biblical names, you have to realize that's why a helpful Bible dictionary is, a Bible dictionary is very helpful, distinguishing certain cities because you have, can have a certain city that's, you know, different places like um, a Paris, Texas, <laughs> not Paris, France. <laughs> So you can have the same city in a different location. So this is Kaddish in the region of Naphtali. That would be along the Sea of Galilee. And by the way, this Zan, uh, Zan uh, Zananam, <laughs> that's my uh, this town is where Sisera is killed eventually, south of Kaddish Naphtali. So um, this area is briefly mentioned uh, in the... Uh, the following verses and later on expounded upon uh, toward the end of the chapter. So eventually Sarah, uh, Sisera meets his demise in the house of jail in that area right there. So Kaddish Naphtali is in this area just north of that region. Let's read on in the text here. Um, verse uh, 10, Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali to Kaddish. And he went up with 10,000 men under his command. Deborah went up with him. Now, Heber the Kenanite, now this is the brief mention here in verse 11 of uh, where the jail's uh, home was. This would be Moses' father-in-law. Uh, Heber, remember, he's the one that gave Moses, uh, of the descendants of Moses' father-in-law, let's say that, not Moses' father-in-law. Heber the Kenanite of the children of Ohobdad, the father-in-law of Moses. So these are the descendants of Moses' father-in-law. Now, remember Moses' father-in-law gave him good advice about how to lead the nation of Israel, dividing the thousands and hundreds and, you know, so forth. Moses was taking on great responsibility, and his father-in-law gave him good advice as far as leading. Uh, these are the descendants. They have separated himself from the Canaanites pitched, and pitched his tent under the oak tree. Uh, terebinth is the word oak tree at... Uh, Zanim, which is beside Kaddish, Kaddish Naphtali. So there's the location, as the text says, not far from Kaddish Naphtali. Verse 12, they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinom, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, all the people who were with him from Harish Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Now this... Um, Former map shows this. Uh, let's take a look here. So here's this Kishon River and the assembly over here. Now, this chapter does not mention Megiddo. Uh, how do we know that uh, they were there by the waters of Megiddo? Well, Deborah's song in chapter 5 tells us that. Uh, so look at chapter 5, verse 19. 
We have further information in chapter 5, verse 19, of the gathering of Sisera and his armies, where that was located. And we also have further information on how they were defeated, which is interesting in chapter 5. The kings came and fought, the kings fought, king of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. So um, that would be this area here. They assembled there and they took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars of their course fought against Sisera. The torrents of Kishon swept them away. Now that would be the Kishon River. So apparently God sent a flood which uh, debilitated the chariots, just like the Red Sea. They got stuck. They couldn't, you know, just even a few inches of rain in a combat situation can change the battle. And that's exactly what happened. God sent a rainstorm. God sent a flood that debilitated near, and the Kishon River apparently overflowed its banks, which caused problems. Remember, chariots of iron would be heavy. These weapons of war would get bogged down and uh, God used the weather <laughs> to uh, play a contributing role in defeating the enemies. So we have that in the Song of Deborah, by the way. That's why it's important to compare scripture with scripture, right? The Bible is its own best commentary. We can have further information as we look at the scripture. Okay, now back in chapter four, um, we have then the gathering there in verse 13. Verse 14, then Deborah said to Barak, up for the Lord, for in this day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand, has not the Lord gone out before you? Notice it's God who gets the credit. God is the one who's leading them in the battle. He is the one that's going before them. So Barak went down from Mount Tabar. So he was at the high point as this map shows. He came down from the high vantage point of Mount Tabor and engaged uh, the enemy in battle. And with him, 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all its chariots and all his armies with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. Apparently, he took off. He took off. This military leader, when he thought, saw that things were not going well, he took off on foot. And he ended up in the opposite direction of the battle, by the way. When we look on a map, he went in the opposite direction. So um, verse 16 says, Barak pursued his chariots in the army as far as Harish Hagim, and all the armies of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Now this former, uh, this would be this direction. This is the area where the army, the children of Israel, notice Canaanite retreat, these areas in the red. So they assembled up here at the foot of Mount Tabor, engaged in battle, and then pursuing the enemy. And they were defeated in this area here. However, Sisera fled away on foot. Uh, he went in the opposite direction, and now he ends up in the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Heber, and the house of Heber the Canaanite. So he thought this was favorable territory. But his wife did not like the things going on, so she was not favored. Husband was. It's interesting. And it was the wife that ended up killing the enemy, as the text says. You know, a woman's going to get credit for all the ultimate victory here. Jael went out to meet Sisera. Now, let's take a look at, um, back to our map of where, let me zoom in on this map. It shows you the arid conflict, Mount Tabar. So they went clear into this area. Megiddo would be this region here. And the retreat would be in this direction, all the way to the area where the original uh, commander, that was his hometown. So we know that Sisera's hometown was there. Where was Sisera? He was not to be found. He went the opposite direction. He went clear over to this area right here. So Mount Tabor is here. The armies were pursued here. And Sisera ends up here in this location right here. So he fled on foot, going the opposite way. Now, here we have um, Jael finally men out to meet Sisera, verse 18. Said then, turn aside, turn, turn aside, my Lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. When turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. Just 
I, we read this earlier, but just just always always laugh when I come to this account here. Just like very gentle, very soft, very nice. Just lay down, you know. I'm gonna give you some warm milk, and you know, <laughs> just bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> So just lay down here, you know, get comfortable in verse 19. Here, please, she, then he said to her, please give me a little water to drink. I am thirsty. So he opened up a jug of milk instead. You know what milk, supposedly, you know, I like a glass of milk for bedtime. So kind of, you know, lulls you to sleep there. So that's the uh, intent here and covered him. He said to her, stand at the door of the tent. If any man comes and inquires of you and says, is there any man here? You shall say no. Then J.L. Heber's wife took a tent peg, took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. Like I said, it gave him a, pound, a pounding headache, right? It went down to the ground for he, he went fast asleep and weary. So he died. In his barrack pursuit, Cicero jail came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. Uh, when he went to her tent, there lay Cicero dead with the, pen, with the peg in his temple. So that day God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel, and the hand of the Lord of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger until Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So this is that account of the battle of Deborah. Now, there's still some questions here um, about the leadership of Deborah. Uh, let's deal with that. Now, there's an excellent book refuting some of the modern feminist views of women being preachers and uh, in positions of leadership in the church. Wayne Grudem, I don't agree with Wayne Grudem on other <laughs> issues, but on this issue, I think he is, uh, has written some excellent um, books on the subject. Wayne Grudem in his book, Evangelical Feminism and Biblical Truth. I'll read this account. Taken as, think of the Bible as a whole from Genesis to Revelation. Where is there one example in the entire Bible of a woman publicly teaching an assembled group of God's people? There is none. Sometimes people mention Deborah in Judges 4, but she did not teach the people publicly, for people came to her privately to hear wise decisions in disputed cases. She used to sit under the palm tree of Palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. In the Old Testament, the priests were responsible. This is very important. In the Old Testament, the priests were responsible to teach the people. And the priests were all men. Very important. Therefore, there is a consistent pattern in Scripture. Men teach and lead God's people. On rare occasion where women gain power as queens in Israel or Judah, such as Jezebel or Athaliah, they led the people into evil. So they could hardly be used as positive examples of women having governing authority over the people of God. So I think that's a poor example if we try to use Deborah. Uh, he goes on to state, Deborah refused to lead the people in military battle, but insisted that a man do this. She insisted that Deborah, Deborah or Barak, you need to go. She's prodding him along. Uh, in fact, Tom Schreiner points out that Deborah is the only judge in the book of Judges who has no military function. It's interesting. No other woman do we see leading the children of Israel in battle. The view that view the Bible views Deborah's judgeship as a rebuke against the absence of male leadership. Judges 4.4. Now this is interesting when we look at Judges 4.4, the way he uh, interprets his text, the way it's written in Hebrew. Now Deborah the prophetess, the wife mentions her as a wife, uh, was judging Israel at that time. Now I'll read this section here. Judges 4.4 suggests some amazement at the unusual nature of the situation in which a woman actually has to judge Israel because it piles up a string of redundant words to emphasize that Deborah is a woman. Translating the Hebrew text, literally, the verse says, And Deborah, a woman, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she was judging Israel at that time. And what he says here is, Something is abnormal, Something is wrong. 
there are no mention to function as judge. That's very interesting. So it's kind of like, hey, this is a woman. <laughs> She's judging Israel where the men should be. Um, now, in subsequent biblical passages that speak of this period of judges, Barak's leadership alone is mentioned. So when we mention, look at 1 Samuel um, chapter 12, verse 11, 1 Samuel 12, verse 11. And the Lord sent Drubal, Bedon, Jephthah, and Samuel. Now, Bedon is another tr way to translate Barak and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And then Hebrews 11.32, what more shall I tell you that Barak, he mentioned there that's a faith hero. Barak is mentioned in Hebrews 11. Deborah is not. Not that she wasn't a godly woman. Now, don't get me wrong when I'm disparaging Deborah. I'm not disparaging her as a woman of faith. God used her. God used that woman of faith. She filled the vacuum for that time. God used that great woman of faith uh, and blessed her, and her faith is commendable, certainly. Uh, but as far as leadership is concerned, you know, that was the issue there. So that's what we're dealing with. We're not disparaging women of faith and how God could use women of faith today. Uh, but we're saying in the area of leadership, the, man sh the men should have led. Now, we have an evangelical feminist called Linda Belleville. She claims that Deborah united the tribes of Israel and led them on to victory. Her assertions are contrary to the text of Judges 4, which says that Barak prophesied that God was commanding Barak to gather your men, verse 6. The text also says that Barak, not Deborah, called out Zebulun and Naphtali, and that 10,000 men went up at his heels, verse 10, in Judges 4, not Deborah. It says that Barak went down from Mount Tabar with 10,000 men following him, verse 14, not Deborah. It says that the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his armies before Barak at the edge of the sword, verse 15. So again, whose mention is leading in battle? Barak in all his passages. Bellevue actually speaks of the army of Israel as Deborah's troops, her troops, but the Bible contains no such language. Bellevue claims that Deborah led them to victory, but the Bible says no such thing. Bellevue is inserting into her own reports of Scripture things that are not there. Deborah encouraged the male leadership of Barak, and the Bible says several times that he led Israel to victory. It's a strong argument that Barak was the one. Now, Deborah was kind of like, I picture in there standing together, and, Bar and Deborah says, come on, go ahead, go on. <laughs> you know, pushes him into battle as he leads the children of Israel. All right. And I uh, think next time we'll look at what about church leadership in the New Testament. Uh, and the Bible clearly indicates that, that is male, male leadership. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, these accounts um, that uh, really inspire faith and courage that uh, even in times of apostasy, you can use individuals to accomplish your purposes, deliver the children of Israel. Certainly, Deborah was one woman who did that. Uh, there was a vacuum of male leadership, and you desire men to lead, Father. We pray that um, you might raise up godly men in this generation who will lead their homes, who will lead the churches, the church, and uh, who will set an example of Christ's likeness to others. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.